Volume 2, Chapter 2 of Mr. Hogarth's Will. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus. Mr. Hogarth's Will by Catherine Helen Spence. Volume 2, Chapter 2. Jane's Situation. In an almost incredibly short time, Mr. Brandon called at Peggy Walker's to say that he had had a letter from Mr. Phillips, who thought very favourably of Miss Melville from his description, but who would come to Edinburgh himself in a day or two and see the young lady, so as to judge for himself. He came accordingly, but to Peggy's great disappointment, without Emily or Harriet. They had both bad colds and he could not make them travel in the depth of winter even to see Peggy. Jane and Elsie could not but admire the kindly greeting to give to his old and faithful servant, and the interest he took in her affairs and her children, which was even more strongly expressed than Mr. Brandon's. And as for Grandfather, he could not tell which of the two Australian gentlemen was the most polite. The manners of the younger sister took Mr. Phillips' fancy more than those of the elder, but he saw that Jane would suit him best. So, in a much shorter time than she could have conceived possible, she found herself engaged to accompany him on his return to London, as housekeeper and governess, at a salary of seventy pounds a year. We mean to come to Edinburgh next summer, when we will probably take a tour in the Highlands, so that you have a prospect of seeing your sister then, said Mr. Phillips. But I must have you with us as soon as possible, so I hope you will be ready the day after tomorrow. Yes, I will be quite ready then, said Jane. I have not much to do except to part from Elsie, and that will be hard to do at last as at first. While Mr. Phillips talked to Peggy about his children, and especially of Emily, the girls both examined his countenance and drew their conclusions as to his character. He was not so handsome as Mr. Brandon, being smaller and more insignificant-looking, and his fair complexion had not stood so well, the constant exposure to the weather under an Australian sun as Mr. Brandon's dark one. But his smile was remarkably bright, and though his manner was very gentle and pleasing, he did not seem to want for decision of character. I doubt Emily is changed out of my knowledge. I have not seen her since she was four years and a half old when you brought her to Melbourne for me to see, and when she coaxed me out of far more lollies than were good for her. I will bring her up in summer, and you will acknowledge that you would know her anywhere. As for you, she will know you quite well. For did not we get your likeness taken at the time, and she shows it to every one as that of her dear old nurse? I hope you are no spoiling the bairn. Oh, no, not much. At least, if we are, we will get Miss Melville to counteract our bad treatment. You are not to make Miss Melville a terror. That's no fair. But the wee things after Harriet, how do you call them? Constance, Herbert, and Eva. Well, they should save the eldest from being destroyed by foolish indulgence, for Emily and Harriet should be learned to give way to them. Everybody gives way to all of the five, but you must not say they are spoiled either. Harriet and Emily, too, learned a lot of monkey tricks on board ship. The gentlemen took so much notice of them, and encouraged a good deal of impertinence in the children. A ship is a bad school for bairns, said Peggy. Mine will become some length before we go on board, and are not like to be so much taken notice of. Does Mrs. Phillips like England? Very much indeed. She will not go back with her own goodwill, and I hope not to need to return. All your friends are in this country, said Peggy, and Mrs. Phillips will have so much new to see her that she will not regret the station. And how's Mrs. Bennet? Is she still with you? And Martha, Mrs. Duck, they call her now? They are both on the station yet, Peggy. Mrs. Bennet, the same admirable woman she used to be, but one cannot advance her any way with such a poor creature of a husband. There is no rise in him. He is a shepherd, and a shepherd he will remain to the end of his days spending his wages in an occasional spree, and then coming back to us to work for more. While that poor silly Martha happened on one of the best men about the place, and I have left him an under-overseer. If the two men could only have exchanged wives, things would appear more equitably arranged. Well, said Peggy, when Mr. Phillips had gone, 
People can see other folks' blunders, but the man that I thought worst mated on the station was the master himself. You will have to take high ground with Mrs. Phillips, Miss Melville, for if you give her an inch, she will take an L. As for him, he is everything that is reasonable. And the bairns, you must just make them mind you, but she is the one that will give you the most trouble. When this engagement was entered into, Jane accompanied Elsie to Mrs. Dunn's, who readily took her into her workroom, and was very much pleased to hear that Miss Melville had got such a desirable situation. The Rennies were also full of congratulations, and felt that their invitations and their getting the sisters an introduction to Mr. Brandon had secured such a magnificent salary from another Australian millionaire. Miss Rennie was particularly pleased that she had dwelt so much on the misfortunes and talents of the sisters. The last evening Jane spent in Edinburgh was passed at the Rennies. Mr. Brandon was asked to meet the girls he had been of such service to. And though Mr. Hogarth was rather dull, and Laura Wilson in a particularly unamiable mood, the liveliness of the Australian settler made it pass off very pleasantly. Jane had not only Mr. Phillips, but Mr. Brandon also as travelling companion. Australians in England have a great tendency to fraternise, even though they were not much acquainted in the colony. And when his old neighbour returned to London, Brandon thought he could not do better than go with him, and go back to the north when it was not quite so cold. The gentlemen had a great deal to say to each other on matters both colonial and English. In English politics they took quite as great an interest as if they had never been out of Britain, and in continental politics they took a greater interest than is usual with English people. Jane was occupied with her own thoughts. The parting from Elsie had been a sad one. So had the good-bye to Frances, who had said so much about her writing if she was unhappy or if she did not think she could keep her situation with a lady of such a peculiar temper as Mrs. Phillips, that she could not help fearing herself for the permanency of the situation. Nothing that had fallen from Peggy or from Mr. Brandon either had prepared Jane for the exceeding beauty of Mrs. Phillips. Jane never had seen a woman so strikingly handsome before. When she spoke, the charm was somewhat broken, for her ideas were not brilliant, and she expressed herself in indifferent English. But in repose she was like queen of romance, tall and large, but exquisitely formed, with a soft, creamy complexion, with a slight, faint rose color on the cheeks, and a more vivid red on the pouting lips, finely shaped brown eyes, and a profusion of rippling dark brown hair. She certainly offered the fairest possible excuse for her husband's marrying beneath his rank, both social and intellectual. Such beauty as Mrs. Phillips is a power, and Jane felt how difficult it would be to take high ground with so exquisite a creature. As Mr. Brandon said, she was handsomer than ever. The girlish beauty of sixteen, which she possessed when she captivated Mr. Phillips, had matured into the perfect beauty of womanhood. Though the mother of five children, she was not, and certainly did not look, twenty-seven. Emily was not so regularly handsome as her mother, but had more animation and more play of feature. Harriet would have been considered a pretty child in any other family, but she was quite a plain one in this. No sooner had Mr. Phillips entered his house than Emily clung round his neck. Harriet mounted on one knee and played with his hair. Constance got on the other to have a little similar amusement with his beard and whiskers. Herbert clamoured for a ride on Papa's foot, and little Eva cried to leave her nurse's arms to be taken up by him too. I was very glad to hear from Mr. Phillips that you was coming, Miss Melville. The trouble of the house and the row of the children make it far too much for me, and when one comes home to England for a holiday, they want to have some peace, said Mrs. Phillips. Now, Miss Emily, you must be on your good behaviour. Now, Miss Melville's come to be your governess. I'm sure I shan't behave any better to her than to my own dear papa, said Emily, with a storm of kisses. You are getting up to be a great girl. I'm sure Miss Melville will be quite shocked at your backwardness. She is a bush child, said Mr. Randon, and has been running wild all her life. You must excuse her for the present, but we hope to see great improvement. 
"'I am much afraid you will be disappointed, you dear old boy,' said Emily, who had left her father and come up to Mr. Brandon, who was her particular favourite. "'Keep your spirits up as well as you can. I am not going to be like your wonderful nephews and nieces at Ashfield. I never saw such ignorant children. They did not know how to make dirt pies, nor could they jump across the ditch, or get up by the trees to the top of the garden wall.' Harriet and I had such a beautiful race round that garden, and they looked on so terrified. They could take the shine out of you at lessons, however, said Mr. Brandon, and I won't take you there again to have another such spirited race till I hear satisfactory accounts of you from Miss Melville. Oh, the race was well enough, but the visit was very slow upon the whole, so I don't think I will break my heart if I never see the place again. Harriet may try to deserve it, but I will not take the trouble. I hate books, said Miss Harriet, except picture books and the fairy tales Papa reads to us. You must not mind what they say, Miss Melville, said Mr. Phillips. I do not intend to do so. I hope to make them like their lessons by and by, and in the meantime they must learn them whether they like them or not. You would be astonished, Lily, said Mr. Phillips, addressing his wife to see what a clever, intelligent family of nephews and nieces Peggy has got. Miss Melville has been good enough to give them some extra instruction, and they certainly have profited by it. But even without that, Peggy has given them every advantage that she possibly could. Oh, Peggy had always very uppish notions, said Mrs. Phillips. It will be a pity if she educates these children above their position. No one knows what position they may not take with such abilities and education in such a colony as Victoria. I may have to stand cap in hand to Tom Lowry yet, said Mr. Phillips. You, Stanley, said his wife, you are so fond of saying absurd things. Don't you know the insecurity of runs? And who knows, but Tom may be Prime Minister or Commissioner of Public Lands or Public Works, or the Chief Engineer on a new railway. That may go right through my squatting rights. My dear Lily, I have a respect for incipient greatness, and when I stood among these young people, I felt they would be rising when I was perhaps falling. Were these your motives? said Mr. Brandon, laughing. I admired the young Lowries for what they were in themselves, and did not go so far into the future as you. I hope, Emily, that in time Miss Melville will make you what Peggy calls keen of your learning as well as her brains. Did you like learning when you were a little girl? asked Emily of Miss Melville. Very much indeed. So Mamma says, but then she did not have to learn very much. If I had not such a horrid lot of tasks, perhaps I might like some of them. But my dear, you are so very ignorant. You have everything to learn now that you have come to England, said her Mamma. But I hope not everything at once, said Jane. Not quite, said Mr. Phillips, but perhaps too much so. You will see the list of the girls' studies tomorrow, and judge for yourself. Mrs. Phillips was favourably impressed with Jane. She was well born and well educated, but she was plain looking. She had heard of her sudden and sad reverse of fortune, and felt disposed to take her up and patronise her. She had suffered from the want of a domestic manager and house counsellor. Even the very good temper and great forbearance of her husband had given way at the small amount of comfort that could be obtained with such a lavish expenditure of money as his had been since they came to London, and he had spoken more sharply to her about her mismanagement than about anything else. So she felt that now he had a housekeeper of his own choosing, she could escape from all responsibility. Her manner to Jane was exceedingly kind, and Jane's hopes rose at her reception. Mrs. Phillips always went to bed early, unless she was kept up by amusement and gaiety. Her style of beauty was of the kind that suits best with plenty of sleep and few cares, so at ten o'clock she said she could sit up no longer, and left Mr. Phillips to explain all the duties expected of Miss Melville so that she need not be disturbed by any inquiries in the morning. Mr. Phillips did so with a clearness and precision that showed he had been often obliged to see to the disbursement of the money as well as the earning of it. He gave Jane the keys and the house books, 
showed her what he thought was the sum he could spend on family expenses, and hoped that she would make it suffice. I wish you to be one of the family, Miss Melville, to visit and go to public places with Mrs. Phillips. I think we may dispense with all the masters for my little girls, except for music, and I hope that you will succeed in making them like both you and their lessons. I also hope, in a short time, to give you still more difficult and delicate work to do, and if you can be successful there, I will be most grateful to you. Mrs. Phillips has had a very imperfect education. She was born in the colonies and was married when a mere child, and since her marriage she has had few opportunities of improving herself either by books or society. I think she feels her deficiencies. So if you could ingratiate yourself with her, she appears to be most favorably disposed towards you at first sight, and induce her to learn a little from you. You would add very greatly to our happiness and comfort, and I should be infinitely your debtor. Mr. Phillips hesitated and coloured a little while he made this suggestion. Jane said she would do what she could, and would be most happy to further his views in this and in every other way, but she felt not a little fearful at the idea of having to ingratiate herself with the woman she had been exhorted to take high ground with and to teach, probably in the most elementary branches, the most lovely creature she had ever seen, the mistress of the house, and a person several years her senior. Still, no difficulty, no honour. She had wanted full employment, and here she was, likely to get it. Jane did not think she had naturally any great turn for children. But the little Phillipses had been so accustomed to have people pet and yield to them, that they actually seemed to enjoy the repose and happiness of obeying, and obeying at once, their calm, grave governess, who never asked them to do anything unreasonable, but yet who always insisted on implicit acquiescence. They were indebted to her for the shortening and simplifying of all their lessons in the first place, and that called out a considerable amount of gratitude. She had a clear way of explaining things to them, and she had such a large information on all subjects that she filled out the dry skeletons of geography and history which children are condemned to learn, and made them look living and real to them. Their father had taught the two elder girls to read, and to read well and fluently, but they had had no other lessons till they had come to London, and found their hitherto unexercised memories quite overtaxed by masters who saw that the girls were quick, intelligent, and observant, with a great deal of practical knowledge quite unusual in England at their years, but absolutely devoid of all school acquirements. They found their lessons much more interesting to learn, and much better retained when learned under Miss Melville than under their masters, and though they were not particularly fond of her, they were very happy with her. Mrs. Phillips's only objection to Miss Melville was her Scotch accent, but before six weeks had passed she had got over that, and thought being in London had softened it down very considerably, and she did not think the children were at all inclined to pick it up. She began to wonder if the governess would not give her some help or some hints, for she was going to visit her husband's relations in Derbyshire for a second time. Her first visit had not been very long and she hoped and wished that she might get on better than she had done before. Her husband had never found any fault with her in the bush of Australia, but her blunders before his father, brother, and sisters had distressed him so much that he had spoken to her many times, rather sharply, in private about them. Though she was a woman of a very indolent character, now that Jane managed all her housekeeping and her servants, wrote all her notes, that, however, was a saving of time to her husband rather than to herself, and relieved her a good deal from the worry of the children. She felt that she had some time on her hands in spite of her going out a good deal to see and to be seen. She was no reader, and had no taste for needlework, but she had the gift of being able to sit in an easy chair, thinking of nothing in particular, and doing nothing at all but looking so beautiful that one might have fancied her thoughts to be one of the most elevated description. One day, while in this state of luxurious ease, 
She asked Jane how long she had been at school, and opened her eyes a hair-breadth or two wider, when she was told of the education so peculiar, so protracted, that Mr. Hogarth had given to his nieces, and that even after she had left off regular study, Jane had never ceased to be learning something. Even now she was keeping up, partly for Tom Lowry's sake, and partly for her own gratification, some of those branches of learning that were likely to be useful to him, and corresponding with him every week on those subjects. Mrs. Phillips sighed, and said she had been married at sixteen, and had been very little at school all her life. She had always been moved from place to place when she was a girl, and there were no schools in the colony that were fit to teach young ladies then. Even now it was the children's education that had been Mr. Phillips's great inducement to come to England, and she liked it very much herself. There was so much to see in London. But would Miss Melville think it very absurd if she were to propose to take lessons now? Jane said she would not think it at all absurd. She was sure Mrs. Phillips would find it very pleasant. But she was rather perplexed when the lady said that her chief ambition was to learn the piano fort and how to make wax flowers. She had no particular taste for music, and no artistic taste at all. But music and wax flowers were expensive, fashionable, and showy accomplishments, and these Mrs. Phillips desired to acquire. These are things, unfortunately, that I cannot give you any assistance with," said Jane, recovering her presence of mind. And perhaps you would not like to have masters and mistresses coming in for yourself. Any other branch of study we could go on with together, and that would be pleasanter. Music demands so very much time if you wish to make rapid progress. Emily only practices an hour and Harriet half an hour a day now, and though their master wished them to practice twice as long, they seem to get on much better since you said they should not be so long at the piano, because it is practicing, not amusing themselves or dawdling, and because it is an hour and half an hour, neither more nor less. And not an uncertain time, which is left to the performer's pleasure, to make any progress with music after you are grown up, you must give three or four hours a day to its acquirement, and that you would find it difficult, almost impossible to keep up. But as I said before, music is a thing I am so ignorant of that I can give you no assistance and no advice on the subject. I would like your assistance," said Mrs. Phillips, "for the children do get on with you. And they say that you make their lessons an amusement. Should you not like to be with us while we are at study and see if you think you could derive any benefit from my method? Come into the schoolroom tomorrow with us. Mrs. Phillips agreed to this and thought the lessons were very pleasant. Sometimes Jane made the little girls repeat their lessons to their mamma, still exercising the supervision which made them feel they must be as careful as heretofore. The oral instruction which accompanied the lessons studied from the book seemed to Mrs. Phillips as well as to the children the most interesting part of it, and as the language was simplified for the comprehension of the little pupils, it was not at all too abstract for their mother. She declared herself delighted with the morning at school and tried to persuade herself that she was only going there to see how her governess did her duty by her children. In this way, by sitting two hours every forenoon with Miss Melville, she contrived to pick up something. And though both her husband and Jane would have been glad if the studies had been prosecuted a little further, they were very much pleased with so much improvement. The idea of learning music still haunted Mrs. Phillips, and she obtained her husband's consent to her having lessons from Emily's master. But her progress was so slow that she tired of it in a month. And blamed her teacher for his stupid, dry way of setting her to work. If Miss Melville had only understood music, she knew she would have got on ever so much better. For she had such a knack of teaching people. On the whole, Jane was satisfied with her situation and with the manner in which she filled it. And when Mr. Phillips paid her her first quarter's salary, he expressed himself in the highest degree satisfied with everything she had done. If she could only have felt that Elsie was well and happy, she would have been perfectly happy herself. But the letters from Edinburgh were not at all cheerful. 
Elsie's account of herself and Francis's account of her were unsatisfactory, and even Peggy had written a few lines recently to say that she was uneasy about her, and did not think the situation at Mrs. Dunn's agreed with Miss Elsie at all. It was still months before she could hope to go to Edinburgh to see her sister, but she wrote, urging her to give up her employment, and to take as much open-air exercise as possible, and also to take medical advice on the subject. But Elsie did not agree to this. The family plans were all laid for a visit to Derbyshire, and Mr. Brandon, who seemed always to be on the move when his old neighbours were leaving London, seeing Jane's distress about her sister, ventured on a good-natured suggestion in her behalf. "'I think you might go up now and see Peggy before you go to Derbyshire. You know she is anxious to see Emily and the other children. I could go with you. I wish so much to see the meeting between them. We cannot go to Scotland so early in the season. Autumn is the time when it is pleasant to travel in the north. But then I cannot be a witness to Peggy's delight, for if you delay so long I'll have to be off to Melbourne before that time.' I thought if you went now, you might leave Miss Melville with her sister while you pay your visit. You do not mean to take her there, and the servants here will, I suppose, to be put on board wages during your absence, so that she need not remain in London. We hope and expect that Miss Melville will accompany us to Derbyshire, that the children may go on with their lessons, and not get into as much mischief as they did on their last visit, said Mr. Phillips. "'I am sure their aunts made great complaints of them,' said Mrs. Phillips, "'and I do not wish to give room for so much complaint again. "'I hope Miss Melville will come with us. "'I would have escorted Miss Melville to Edinburgh before I went to Ashfield, "'for I must see that worthy Peggy again before I leave England, "'and visit my Edinburgh relatives again, too. "'And my time is getting short,' said Mr. Brandon. "'But if you cannot spare her, I cannot do anything but to go to see her sister.' and report myself on her appearance. Perhaps your letters are duller than the reality. Did you not tell me your sister was a milliner, Miss Melville? What a sad thing! I am sure you are such a treasure to us that I wish some other family would take your sister, said Mrs. Phillips. She thinks millinery preferable to idleness, but the long hours and the cold rooms and the solitary life are too hard upon her. It must be dull for her to have no other society but that of our good Peggy and her brains after a long day's work. Don't you think, Lily, that it would be a pleasant change for her to come and spend a few weeks with us after we return to London, as her sister cannot yet go to her? said Mr. Phillips. The idea of befriending Jane's sister in this way was not disagreeable to Mrs. Phillips. The invitation was given and joyfully accepted. Mr. Brandon would delay his visit to the north till it was about the time for Elsie to come down, and would take care of her on the way. Jane felt happy in this new proof of the kind of feeling of the family towards her, and accompanied them to Derbyshire with a lighter heart. Mr. Phillips's father was a medical man, with an excellent country practice, intelligent, chatty, and hospitable. He had married a Miss Stanley, who was not only of very good birth, but who had a considerable fortune, which was settled on her children. Her eldest son's portion of it had been the nucleus of the handsome fortune he had realized in Victoria. The old gentleman had been long a widower, and his two unmarried daughters lived with him, and kept his house, while his younger son had been brought up to assist his father in his profession, and eventually to succeed to the practice. But he, seeing how well his brother Stanley had got on, had a great hankering after an unlimited sheep run in Australia. The Mrs. Phillips were not young, but they were well-dressed, well-mannered, and good-looking. There was a happy, prosperous, confident air about both of the sisters, and especially about the younger of the two. They were the darlings of their father, the first in their own set of acquaintances, a great deal taken notice of, on account both of their mother's social position and their father's professional talent, by county families successful in domestic management, successful in society of good understanding and well educated, the Mrs. Phillips were looked up to very much and felt that they deserved to be so. They were much disappointed in their brother's wife 
from his letters and the likenesses he had sent home they were prepared for a romantic and interesting as well as beautiful woman but her want of education and of understanding which they soon discovered on personal acquaintance was most mortifying to ladies who thought they possessed both in a high degree and they were quite distressed at having to introduce her into society the husband saw and felt their coldness towards his wife while mrs phillips filled his ears with complaints of their uppishness and their disagreeable ways mr phillips had been so proud and so fond of his sisters and had talked so much to her about their beauty their cleverness and their goodness that she thought she too had a right to be disappointed their beauty had diminished during his fourteen years absence in australia their cleverness only made her uncomfortable and their goodness did not seem to extend to her what right had a couple of ordinary looking old maids to look down on her a married woman of so many years standing so much younger and handsomer she liked jane melville far better than either of her sisters-in-law for with more real mental superiority there was an inferiority in position that set her at her ease mr phillips was a little disappointed with his sisters though he would scarcely own it to himself the blooming girls of twenty-one and seventeen whom he had left were somewhat faded in the course of the many years absence and the very different lives that they had led made them take different views of most subjects their opinions had hardened separately and when they met again they did not harmonize as they had done his sisters were more aristocratic in all their tastes and feelings than the australian squatter they had scarcely mixed at all with children and had no patience with his wild bush children whose frankness and audacity were so terribly embarrassing and they had shown their disappointment at his misalliance very decidedly but on this occasion things went on much better both mrs phillips and the children were decidedly improved and the sisters-in-law gave miss melville the credit of it and liked her accordingly miss melville was presentable anywhere though she was only a governess the tale which mr phillips told of a reverse of fortune interested them all particularly the old gentleman he had met with jane's uncle when he had been studying in paris who was then only a younger son and had been just released from the strict discipline of a scotch puritanical home and not being ambitious of filling the subordinate office of jock the laird's brother wished to learn a profession and thought he might try medicine as well as anything else he was then clever idle and extravagant but a great favorite with everybody jane questioned dr phillips about the date of this acquaintance but it had occurred before the supposed time of francis birth so that he could throw no light on that question still she wrote to francis on the subject though she had thought his letters lately had been colder than before and feared that his friendship for her was not so deeply seated as hers for him willing to show that her feelings towards him were unchanged she entered into the same minute description of the family she was at present living with as she had done of the pupils and the employers and the visitors in london she was at this time more interested in dr phillips and his younger son vivian than in any of the ladies of the family and felt particularly puzzled to explain the desire of the latter to leave the country and his profession when he had talents quite sufficient to make a good figure for such a life as mr brandon's had been in the australian bush he was the most scientific man whom jane had met with in society and as he met with very little sympathy from either of his sisters in his chemical experiments or his geological researches he appreciated her intelligent and inquiring turn of mind there were many things he could throw light on which would be of service to tom lowry and were mentioned in her letters to him young dr vivian phillips had submitted to a great deal of the inevitable spoiling which an only brother at home receives georgiana was very strongly attached to him and though harriet had always said that she preferred stanley yet when he came back with his uncongenial wife and large family of young children to engross nine-tenths of his heart her partiality for him seemed to fade away and she felt that vivian was far better than the other at least 
more clever and more english in his ideas but stanley was more liberal and had a better temper vivian had fits of bad temper which no one could conquer and his sisters found it was the only plan to let him alone vivian would never think of falling in love with his brother's governess he knew his own position too well for that so that his sisters had no fear of his being in any danger when jane joined him in his experiments in the laboratory or went out with him and the children geologizing and they were perfectly right in that surmise he liked jane because he felt her to be a perfectly safe person just a little more interesting than a companion of his own sex and one to place rather more confidence in for she had more sympathy and more enthusiasm but she had excellent sense and did not appear to be at all impressible jane described the beautiful country walks she took which she was sure francis or elsie would appreciate far better than she could do she contrasted the activity and full life of the gentlemen of the house with the languid idleness of mrs phillips and the busy idleness of her sisters-in-law and thought it very unjust that all the work of the world should be done by the one sex and so little left for the other she had thought the mrs phillips superior to the swinton young ladies at first but on closer acquaintance she found it quite as difficult to grow intimate with them she thought she would prefer the high church and almost puseyite tendencies of the english women to the narrow and gloomy views of her scotch neighbors but her first independent turn of mind her eager love of inquiry and her thirst for truth were as much cramped by the one as the other an enormous part of mrs phillips lives was occupied in visiting and receiving visitors their superintendence of their father's household was very different from what had been expected from jane and elsie at cross hall they had old and faithful servants who knew their work and did it and rarely troubled their mistresses for orders they did not take the same interest or trouble about the poor which the mrs melville had done if dr phillips mentioned any case of distress the cook was directed to send broth or wine or they might even give a little money but there was no personal inconvenience suffered or sacrifice made for the relief of want or the comforting of sorrow the charity was given with the smallest amount of sympathy and accepted with the smallest amount of gratitude in public matters in social progress in sanitary reforms all the gentlemen took a lively interest but the ladies considered these things quite out of their own line there was this difference however between the sisters that georgiana the eldest could make any sacrifice cheerfully for any member of her own family but harriet was disinclined to make any even for them it is not to be supposed that the world in general saw all these traits as jane in her peculiar circumstances and with her observant powers had so much opportunity of doing they were considered to be very superior and very amiable young ladies and mr brandon had been rather surprised at himself for not fixing his affections on harriet who as the favorite sister of his dearest friend would be suitable in every respect and who appeared to have all the qualifications to make a good wife end of volume 2 chapter 2 recording by red abras october 2008